So today we're going to start revising part two of the Conflict and Tension First World War AQA GCSE course. So part two starts with the Schlieffen Plan and Trench Warfare, which is what we're going to be doing today. Just looking at the start of that stalemate. There will be a separate video looking over the key battles, which are Verdun, the Somme, Passchendaele and Gallipoli. I do already have two videos on this channel, one looking at the long term causes of the First World War and the second looking and Balkan crises and the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. So if you haven't already revised that, you could use those videos to revise part one of the course. So we're going to start off with just looking at the Schlieffen plan. Now, the key word that you really need for this first part is this word encirclement. You need to understand encirclement. If you've already revised the start of the course, then you probably already know what that means because it's a key concern of Germany. So Germany, this is their biggest worry is this concept of encirclement. What it means is that Germany is surrounded by enemies. Those enemies in particular are France and Russia. They signed an alliance in 1892, the Franco-Russian alliance. France is an old enemy anyway, so Germany feels quite threatened that they border both countries. So you've got France to the west, Russia to the east. This means that if there's ever a war, Germany would, might have to face both countries at the same time, which means they would have to split their troops and fight on two fronts, which ultimately weakens any army. So this is Germany's big concern. So if you don't know that, revise it, it is really, really important. OK, so we're going to start off just by looking at the Schlieffen plan. Now, what you need to know about the Schlieffen plan is you need to know what it is, when and why it was made, what happened in August 1914 and why it failed, and also the impact of that failure, so the consequences. How does it lead to the, the stalemate in the First World War? How does it lead to the building of trenches? OK, now these cause and consequence thinking maps are good for revising your conflict and tension course because question three is always an account question so write an account of how something led to something else and ultimately the skills that you've got to demonstrate is your understanding of cause and consequence so what happened during an event what caused an event and the consequences or impact of that event and you've got to link the event itself to a specified consequence so it might say for instance write an account of how the failure of the Schlieffen plan led to the stalemate on the Western Front or the building of trenches on the So you've got to talk about the Schlieffen plan, why it was needed, why it failed, and link it to whatever else is mentioned in the question. So the building of trenches, for instance. So you can do this one of two ways. You can either copy down this exact thinking map just like this, or you can just write down the headings, causes, what happened, consequences. And I estimate you'll probably need about six lines between each if you're writing it on paper, on lined paper. Um, I'm just going to mute myself for just a second, but you might need to pause to give yourself enough time to copy this down. OK, so we're going to start off by talking about what the Schlieffen plan was, when it was made, why it was made and what the plan itself actually entailed. And this will help you to fill out that first box on the background. So the Schlieffen plan was first devised between. In 1907 and 1905 uh, by a man called Ron Schlieffen. It's actually named after him. And he was the leader of the German army in 1905. He made the plan because he was nervous that Russia and France had signed the Franco-Russian alliance in 1892, meaning that Germany would be attacked from both sides if there was ever a war. And war, remember, is getting increasingly more likely because you've got that build up of those four main long term causes. So you've got militarism, alliances, imperialism and nationalism. 
Once she even knew that France would expect Germany to attack through Alsace-Lorraine because they owned it now after the Franco-Prussian War of 1871, 1872-1871, sorry. However, the plan was to surprise them by going through neutral Belgium. So if a country's neutral, it means that they're not involved in the war, they're not on either side, and you shouldn't move through it, you shouldn't enter a neutral country in a time of war at all. That's the whole point of neutrality. So they, they argued, Germany argued that France wouldn't expect that. It would be a surprise. Von Schlieffen also knew that Russia, although it was a very large country with a lot of men in their military, they were extremely slow and technologically quite in advance, quite primitive, meaning that it would take them a while to get to France's aid, which would give Germany an advantage. If they went for Russia first, France would be tipped off that they, they were planning to come for France next. They would know. Um, so France would have more time to prepare to station troops and they could be with Russia quite quickly because the French army was stronger and also France had better technology and they faster. So that's why the decision was made to go for France first, knock out the larger power. The whole plan relied on the swift defeat of France. And if this tech took lo longer than normal, sorry, longer than expected, rather, uh, Russia might be there to assist France and it might mean that Germany would have to split their troops. So the, the plan had to be executed really, really quickly. So this is the plan itself. It was actually amended several times, um, the first time being in 1906, and it was scaled down. So the plan that was eventually executed was not von Schlieffen's and it was changed. Um, but as I said, the plan was designed so that Germany wouldn't have to fight on two fronts and they wouldn't have to fight France and Russia at the same time. That was the whole point of the plan. And they were hoping that by catching, catching the French by surprise, the large but slow Russia would not be able to support them in time. And you can see the diagram here. Von Schlieffen thinks that France would expect Germany to invade through Alsace-Lorraine, which you can see is where the black arrow is pointing to on my map. However, they're going to enter through neutral Belgium, which is that green country at the top. And the red arrows show the direction that Germany would move in. So they're going to swoop down in a semicircle motion capture Paris, which is in the centre of um, France, which you can see on your map is that yellow country. It's near the centre. Um, and then they're going to turn their whole army around and head back through Germany towards Russia. In terms of time, the Germans estimated that it could take them around 40 days to capture Paris and France would be out of the war then. And then Russia would mobilise in six weeks. So they would have enough time to turn their, all their troops around and fight Russia alone. Remember, the whole plan is they don't have to fight both countries at the same time. So why did the plan go wrong? Um, so the plan was enacted after the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo um, and Austria-Hungary, obviously we already know this, but Austria-Hungary Austria immediately blamed Serbia. Austria-Hungary declare war on Serbia when they fail of their ultimatum and Russia defends them because they are both Slav. Germany orders Russia not to support Serbia and to back down, but Russia ignored them. Remember, Russia have backed down once before in the Balkans to Germany and they didn't want to do it again. Germany formally declares war on Russia, but they don't attack Russia. They move their army towards their uh, Russia's ally, France, and that's the Schlieffen plan. Also, by enacting the Schlieffen plan, it's important to note Germany has guaranteed the involvement of France. They've guaranteed that it's not just going to be in Russia, it's going to involve France. Arguably, that would have happened already because they are part of the alliances, but it's an interesting point to note. When they invade neutral Belgium, Britain orders them to stop. And when they don't listen, Britain declares war on Germany. So not only has the Schlieffen plan guaranteed the involvement of France, but moving through Belgium specifically involves Britain. And we'll come back to that on the next slide. So what goes wrong for Germany? The first thing that goes wrong is they were not expecting Belgium really to fight back. They thought that it would be really easy to defeat Belgium because Belgium is quite small, but also Belgium, because they haven't really been militarising on the same scale as the other countries in Europe. So they are militarily quite weak. But Belgium put up a really heroic fight and hold the Germans back by two weeks, which is a significant amount of time. And it gave Britain and France more time to prepare their troops. And now they know the direction that the Germans are coming from. They can station their troops accordingly to be able to fight the Germans when they enter France. 
The second thing that goes wrong is that Russia mobilizes in 10 days rather than the six weeks that Germany had expected. And Germany had to send 100,000 troops to support Austria-Hungary on what does become the Eastern Front. So now they are fighting on two fronts, which is exactly what they were trying to avoid. And then the third thing that happened stick to the Treaty of London, which is a law from 1839, um, which said that Britain would basically protect Belgium's neutrality. So because Belgium is a neutral country, if anyone invades Belgium in a time of war, Britain would protect them. And Britain declare war on Germany and send the BEF, which is the British Expeditionary Force, to support Belgium and also wait for the Germans in France. Um, these were 125 to 150,000 specialist uh, British troops, the best of the British army. They'd also been building up the BEF um, for several years, so they were prepared and the whole EF was that if anything happened with France, they would be there to protect France or to support France. So they're the three things that go wrong. You do need to learn those um, those three things. So what is the impact of the failure? So ultimately, in short, it is the, the building of trenches and uh, the, the start of this four year stalemate. We'll, we'll break it down just a little bit more. So Germany is significantly weakened because they are now fighting on two fronts, the Eastern Front and the Western Front, which is exactly what they wanted to avoid. Furthermore, Britain had a war, which disadvantaged Germany further because they knew that Britain was strong, specifically in terms of naval power. So now it's going to be much harder for Germany to get control of the seas. If it wasn't for the Schlieffen plan, Britain might not have joined the war. So before this point, Britain had something called splendid isolation, which is when they were basically focusing on themselves, keeping their empire, keeping their wealth. Um, and they're not really concerned about events in Europe. They certainly don't want to get involved in a European war militarily. They might have got involved politically, such as events in Morocco. Send their, their army and their resources to a war in Europe if they can help it. But by breaking the Treaty of London, Germany pretty much guaranteed uh, British involvement. And that's the reason Britain joined the war. Um, and then the final consequence is that Germany was not able to defeat France quickly, which led to the Battle of the Marne, which ended in stalemate. The whole war slows down and ultimately that stalemate lasts for four years. OK, so you might need to pause this, replay various parts just to get your cause and consequence thinking map finished. Um, but move on to a couple of sources before moving on to the Battle of the Marne and trenches. So this is the first source that we are going to look at. The reason it's important to look at sources with your World War I paper specifically is because two of your questions um, deal with sources. You actually get three sources on this paper. Question one is a four mark question which, which asks you about one source, but question two is a 12 mark question which is quite a big it's a big question, uh, quite a lot of marks available, which ask you about two sources and how useful they are together. So we're going to look to begin with, with this four mark question. And the question always, it gives you a source and it'll ask you, um, this source supports or opposes something. Sometimes it'll ask this source is critical of something or criticizes something, how do you know? Um, and you have to talk about the reasons that you have to pick out two reasons that you know and write two paragraphs explaining how you know that this source is either supportive or positive or negative, critical, um, in opposition of. It can vary the terminology, but it's always is it positive or is it negative, basically. Um, so this is the source we're going to look at in terms. It's quite simple to understand. Now, when you first see this source, you might not know what, what's going on, but I do urge you not to panic. There are always clues with these sources. So what can we see on the surface? We can see a man running. Um, he's pointing. His face looks quite shocked, surprised. And then behind him, he's being um, followed by a steamroller. Now, we don't have steamrollers anymore, so you might look at that and think, hmm, it looks a bit like a train. It does look a bit like a train, but it's got that roar on the front, which obviously would crush anything in its way. Now, what are the clues that tell you what this source is really saying? So if you look very closely on the front of the steamroller, it literally says 
Russia. And then at the bottom of your source, the caption reads the steamroller. So you can infer from that that this is a steamroller and that it represents Russia. So you haven't had to do much other than look at your source to figure out who that steamroller represents and what it is. Now, you should be able to say represents Russia. They are kind of nicknamed the steamroller in the source. And this source suggests that they are moving really quickly and that they're crushing whatever is in their way. Now, what is in their way? Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary is next to Russia and it was Austria-Hungary's job to hold Russia off until the German army could get there. Now, the man at the front who's running he represents Austria-Hungary and they're running away in a panic. If you have a look, their hat has, has fallen off, they're pointing, their face looks quite shocked. Um, and then the caption is steamroller and it says, Austria, I say you know you're exceeding the speed limit. So it's saying that Russia wasn't expected so soon. So Russia is exceeding the speed limit or Russia is going a lot faster than Austria-Hungary or Germany expected. And from our knowledge, we know um, that they expected Russia to take about six weeks, but it took 10 days. So it was a lot quicker and it would have taken Austria by surprise. In terms of the provenance of this source, it's a British cartoon um, from 1914, September 1940. It does give you an extra clue here. It says the steamroller says Russia. So always look in the provenance for a bit of a clue of anything that is unclear in the source, because sometimes they will put clues down there as well. So make sure you read that. So the significant parts is that it's a British cartoon from September 1914. Um, it, it's important that it's British because Britain obviously was Russia's ally in the Triple Entente, which was signed in 1907. And it means that they would want to support Russia in any propaganda at the start of the war. So this source here is. It's saying that Russia are crushing whatever's in their way. Russia are crushing Austria-Hungary. And the source was published in uh, September 1914, which is just one month into the war. So the Entente powers, Russia, France and Britain might be feeling quite confident. Germany is weaker at this point because the Schlieffen plan has literally just failed and Germany is fighting on two fronts. This is literally a month into the war and everybody's going to be, well, Britain is going to be feeling a lot more optimistic. Germany, not so much, um, but Britain's going to be feeling a lot more optimistic. So that's why this source is so positive. question you could be asked is um, this source supports the Russians at the start of the war how do you know and it's worth four marks so you're going to write two paragraphs what I would do is in the first paragraph try and talk about the content of the source so what it shows but focusing at all times on why it supports the Russians um, and then the second paragraph I might go to the provenance and talk about the provenance I believe the mark scheme says content and or provenance but you have to talk about it in a detailed and developed way in order to get the four out of four. I talk about content and provenance just in case you don't get one in enough detail. I talk about the content first and then the provenance in the second paragraph. You can do it either way around, but that's just how I would learn the structure. So here are your sentence starters. You can take a screenshot of this or you can pause the video and have a go at this now. It should take you about five minutes. Um, because we kind of try and work on this mark per minute basis. So four to five minutes. If you get extra time, it will be about, you can take about six, seven minutes on this question. OK, so once you've done that or once you've screenshotted it to do later, there is another one here. So this is a second source that we're not going to go through together because you can take the skills that I've shown you in that last um, on that last source analysis and you can apply it to this on your own. So what you can see here is you can see a big angry man with sausages coming out of his pocket and quite a big club in his hand facing off with a child, a small child that is in front of a fence that says no thoroughfare, which basically means no entry. Come through here. Um, the child looks fearful, but he's not letting this big, scary old man through. And it says Bravo Belgium as the caption. And it's a British cartoon from a popular magazine, which is Punch magazine. And it was published on the 12th of August 1914. So again, you can screenshot this and you can have a go at this later on. 
OK, so we're going to swiftly move on to the Battle of the Marne and the construction of trenches. Now, you don't need to know this battle in as much detail as you need to know the four major battles, but you do need to know what happens. Now, you would only really be asked about the Battle of the Marne in relation to perhaps a source um, or in relation to the Schlieffen plan or the building of trenches. So you just need a rough idea of what happens and how it links to both the Schlieffen plan and also the construction of trenches. you write this down on your paper um so question how how explain how the stalemate led to the building of trenches to the start of the stalemates or um the schlieffen plan basically and the challenge is why was trench warfare so hard for military leaders to plan for i would write both of these questions down you probably need about about six lines six to eight lines because you're going to explain the battle of the marne here and also the, the actual construction of trenches. So you do need quite a bit of room there to take some notes. OK, so let's start off with the Battle of the Marne. So why were trenches introduced? Um, so the trenches were introduced basically as a consequence of the failure of the Schlieffen plan and also because of the Battle of the Marne. So the Battle of the Marne was the Germans attempt to capture Paris after the Schlieffen plan failed. By now, they were desperately trying to make up for lost time. So they've been held back by two weeks in Belgium. Remember, they want to capture Paris within the 40 days. So everything is speeding up. They're trying to move a lot quicker. Um, but the issue is that their troops are completely exhausted, hungry, and also a lot smaller than the number of troops they'd with because remember 100,000 troops had had to be sent to the Eastern Front to support Austria-Hungary and fight the Russians. Despite this, they'd actually made up good time and they are now at this point within 40 kilometres of Paris and they're moving extremely quickly. So Britain and France need to come up with a plan in order to defend Paris because remember if Paris is captured then France is out of the war. The British and the French choose to attack from the west, forcing the Germans to turn and fight them, which meant that they had to abandon their plan to capture Paris for the time being. And what ended up happening as a result is that a huge gap appeared in the German troops and the British and French were able to exploit that and move in to attack. The Germans are forced to retreat and they have no other option other than to build trenches for protection. So trenches are just long narrow ditches in the ground that offer your men and your equipment protection from bullets, shells um, and whatever the enemy is firing in your direction. So the British also end up digging trenches because obviously the Germans are in their trenches firing at the British and the French and the British and French would have no protection. So they build trenches directly opposite the German trenches. And this is where the Marne ends in a stalemate. So this is the Battle of the Marne itself. That's pretty much all you need to know. And you do need to know that it ends in a stalemate. Now, both sides are literally facing each other in their trenches and they basically have nowhere to go. So the Germans make a crucial decision and they decide that they had to head north in an attempt to capture the French ports at the English Channel. So you can see on the map here, the French ports would have been all along um, the north coast of France and Germany is, at is attempting to dig their trenches northward ports so that they can control anything that's coming into France. They want to starve France out of the war and this is the first time we really get this war of attrition. So a war of attrition is a key term. It's wearing your enemy down slowly to the point where they completely collapse and you do this by blockading them. You do this by just completely pummeling them and trying to deplete their resources as much as possible. Um, the British and French obviously have no choice but to follow and try and stop them. So what you've got is you've got both sides digging trenches as they went northwards, which creates the Western Front. This is this event is called the Race to the Sea, um, but it creates the Western Front, which you can see on the map is those line of trenches that stretch the whole um, the whole length of France. So the Battle of the Marne ends in stalemate, it leads to the race to the sea, which leads to um, 
Western Front and the start of this four-year stalemate. Now, in terms of an explanation for what you've just written down, um, if you didn't get anything, you could copy this down. But I'm just going to talk about the challenge question um, really quickly. Um, so trench warfare, it's quite a new it was quite a new way of fighting um, by this point. Don't get me wrong, trenches had been used in warfare before, but never on this scale. Um, so never before had you had two sides that were so equally matched. And they were so equally matched because of this militarism that had been going on for years. Both sides had um, newer technology. They had better weaponry. And it was clear that this war was going to be a lot more bloody as a result of that. So the only choice either side had, because they were so equally matched and no one was really getting anywhere or making any progress, was to try and defend um, and, and keep hold of the resources that they already had. And it quickly becomes a war the side with the better resources uh, and the most resources were going to win so you've got to defend those resources that you've got so the building of trenches was for defense but what it ended up doing was it ended up prolonging this war and making it last years and years and years and neither side really knew what to do military leaders didn't really know how to plan for it because it had never happened like this before so it was really really hard to make progress and any progress that was made was extremely slow so you'll see in the battles that we do in the next video that any military gains are extremely small um, there's no real military gains happening for four years um, so that's why trench warfare is extremely hard for military leaders to plan for okay so we're just gonna have a look at trenches so i want you to fill uh sorry split a full a4 page up um user ruler and it makes your notes look a lot neater and it means that when you're reading back over it it's well presented it's easier for you to revise from um, but I want you to write the following headings so the first trench layout or features the second trench conditions and the third trench weapons and what we're going to do is we're just going to read through some information together and I'd like you to make notes in each of these boxes you might need to pause in order to do that OK, so we'll start off with the trench layout. So you've got quite a nice diagram here, but trenches, ultimately, the purpose of them is that they are built for defence. They are built in a zigzag formation, not in straight lines, which you can see again from the diagram here, which offers them extra protection if an enemy entered the trench, but also from shelling. So what it meant was if you had like straight lines of trenches and they were just lit horizontal or vertical line if those trenches were shelled it was more likely that more of the wall of the trench would fall in and obviously you'd have to repair it whereas in these zigzag um, portions uh, a smaller part of the trench might cave in which just makes it easier to repair also if a member of the enemy side gets into your trench if the trenches are a straight line they could literally just fire all the way down and take out anything in the way whereas these zigzag um kind of nooks and crannies that you could like hide in and um, they just give the men in the trenches a lot more protection um, there's also multiple rows of trenches which you can see on the map here with the front line being the most dangerous so the front line is right at the the front there it faces the enemy and the area between the two enemy trenches is called no man's land There would be sandbags along the edges of the trenches to try and offer extra protection from flying bullets. You can see from the diagram here that they are in front of you facing the enemy, but also behind you. Um, the idea is that it would help with friendly fire. So if a member of your um, troop shot a, or there's a stray bullet, it wouldn't hit you in the back of the head. It's more likely to hit the sandbag. And there's also barbed wire in front of the trenches and through no man's land to offer that extra protection and try and stop the enemy from entering your trench. Now, it was um, some of the barbs on it were extremely sharp and extremely long. It could literally cut you down to the bone. So um, it, it's just rolls and rolls and rolls of barbed wire. So you might think, oh, you could just jump over it. You could just get through it. You can, but it, it can cause significant injury on its own. Um, there are also dugouts underground. Um, you can see that on this diagram here. The Germans had larger dugouts, actually, and the German trenches were reinforced, um, some of them with like steel and concrete. Some of them had 
um, electricity and better sanitation whereas the British and French trenches because they didn't think they'd be there for so long it's often just mud and wooden boards and the dugouts were a lot smaller so the dugouts often in the British and French trenches um, only allowed protection for the officers and um, people of rank. Um, there were also communication and vertically so that information supplies could be sent from the reserve trenches to the front line and back and forth. Um, so maybe just pause the video and have a look at this um, diagram. This should all be revision. Um, so you do also have things like knowledge organisers and notes that give you a bit more detail on this. Um, but the diagram, some of this stuff you should be familiar with already. OK, in terms of conditions in the trenches, um, conditions were absolutely terrible. And these, these, this is the part that a lot of students do naturally remember. So we'll go through it quite quickly. So the first thing that you need to know about is trench foot. There is a picture here, um, but the trenches were damp. They're dirty. The, the mud and water at the bottom of British trenches in particular uh, could reach the wastes of the soldiers living in them. And due to this, it's impossible for soldiers to keep their feet and their boots dry. And when your feet are wet for quite a long period of time, you can get trench foot which is a disease that is extremely painful your feet initially turn black the tissue will rot and the toes will eventually fall off it was very smelly um, very painful um, and obviously it would lead to sepsis and death because this is before the um, invention of any antibiotic so it's before penicillin there are other diseases as well. So due to the dirty nature of the trenches, they were absolutely swarming with rats. There were reports that these rats could actually get as big as cats and they would crawl over the soldiers as they slept. The rats could carry bacteria which could infect soldiers with various diseases like trench fever, uh, which didn't kill soldiers, but it could make them very ill, which obviously removes them from combat for quite a while. Other diseases like it would spread quickly and were very deadly because the men lived extremely close together um, and as this was before the invention of antibiotics antivirals any real medication soldiers would die um, and it's said that more soldiers died in the trenches of disease than in actual combat during the first world war another issue was boredom so believe it or not soldiers would face terrible boredom uh, the war was at a stalemate with neither side winning or making any real military great gains it's a very very slow war uh, and it means that most of the time soldiers were in the trenches waiting to attack. They were away from their friends, family, and would try and help with the boredom by writing letters, uh, keeping diaries. There's quite a lot of poetry that comes out of the trenches. Just anything, card games, anything to try and keep their minds occupied. But it was mind-numbingly boring for the majority of the time. And then finally, we have these kind of mental health issues so shell shock and desertion so shell shock is a type of mental illness caused by war it's basically ptsd um but it wasn't understood to be that at the time um the disease was first observed or sorry the disorder was first observed in 1915 and was called shell shock because it was believed that it was caused by loud bangs of the shells or bombs However, it's now understood that it is caused by being exposed to extreme trauma. For example, terrible trench conditions for a long period of time, um, seeing friends, fellow soldiers being killed, and symptoms included uncontrollable shaking, crying, not being able to speak, uh, sorry, move, that's meant to say, not being able to speak, move, sleep, and a fight or flight response that might lead to soldiers trying to run away or refusing orders. But if they did do that, they were called cowards, they were accused of desertion, which means that you are basically trying to desert a cause or leave a cause. And the punishment for that was execution. So these men were shamed as cowards when really they were suffering with quite a serious mental condition caused by the trauma of the trenches. Something else that isn't really mentioned here is lice. There'd be lice in the clothes and it was just impossible to keep clean. Um, OK, so finally, we're going to look at um, the technology in the trenches before we. Um, 
go for today. So I'm just going to run through this. What you might want to do is make some notes. I mean, you could print this if you wanted to, if you can screenshot it and print it. Um, and then you could go through and highlight the positives and negatives of each of these pieces of equipment in different colors. Um, so the first thing we're going to look at is machine guns. So machine guns are guns that can shoot numerous times in a row, so numerous rounds at once. One machine gun had the power of around 80 rifles and could shoot up to 600 small caliber rounds per minute, so basically small bullets. The issues with machine guns at the time is that they were extremely heavy, about 30 to 60 kilos each, which meant that they were very hard to four to six men to operate a machine gun. Early machine guns would also overheat very easily and needed to be cooled down with water. So nowadays you might picture a machine gun as being something very small, very portable, handheld. Um, these machine guns certainly weren't like that. As I said, they would take four to six men to operate. They were very effective, but at the same time, um, they were still in their infancy in terms of technology. This technology had just been developed in the decades prior, so it was still really, really new. And it's the first time that machine guns were used in such a large. I mean, this is the first conflict of this size anyway, but it's they are very new technology. And like all of this technology, they do develop quite a lot throughout the war. So by the end of the war, they are smaller, they are more portable. They don't have such an issue with overheating because fans are fitted on them. Um, the technology become, comes really far and they do become very, very, very effective by the end of the war. But at the start of the war, they're quite big, quite clumsy. They overheat, but they are they do shoot more rounds. Um, than your standard rifle. The second thing is artillery. So artillery are huge guns. They almost look like cannons and they could shoot shells, which are small bombs that would explode on impact. They can shoot really fast. They are a long, long range weapon and they can cause a lot of damage. However, without GPS, it was really hard to aim them and you could miss your target, hit something else. Um, sometimes it would... Um, you, the men would destroy their own trenches with their artillery because they were so hard to aim. Artillery were extremely heavy, took multiple men to operate, and when you fired the artillery, the whole thing would roll backwards. The wheels, and you would have to roll it back forward before you could fire again, which wastes valuable time in battle slows you down um, but the shells that you could put into the artillery they could have shrapnel they could just be standard bombs or they could also have gas in them so they are um, quite a useful weapon the next thing is a grenade so grenades are small portable handheld bombs that are light and easy to transport all soldiers would be able to use these um, they were easy to use because all you would do is you'd simply pull out the pin at the top throw it and after a short delay However, they could only reach as far as a man could throw. So the range isn't really very far, probably around 15 to 20 metres maximum. So they're not as long range as the other two weapons that we've mentioned, but they are really easy to use and they'd be used all the time in battle. Now, tanks are really, really interesting. So tanks were used for the first time during the First World War. They're huge machines that could be used to drive over no man's land, flattening anything in the way, even the barbed wire. And they would offer excellent protection to anyone. And then inside would be protected by this um, metal armour. However, because they were very new technology, similar to the machine guns, um, they are, again, quite undeveloped. The Germans figure out really, really quickly that they could attack the back wheel, stop the tanks from working. Um, tanks would also just break down. And what happens when a tank breaks down in the middle of no man's land? All the men inside have to evacuate, try and run back to their trenches. But obviously the enemy is going to see and uh, you would be shot with machine guns. Um, so the British and French actually invested in tanks and kept developing them throughout the war. Germany had tanks but didn't really see the use in them so they didn't develop, uh, especially when they saw them at the Battle of the Somme, which they they, they weren't at the Battle of the Somme, the Germans didn't really develop um, as many tanks as the British and the French, but the, tr the French and the British, they really kept going with this tank technology and by the end of the war they, they did use them very successfully, the technology developed and it ended up that they they helped the British and the French to victory in the Hundred Days Offensive in 1918. Um, next, we've got gas. So poisonous gases were used during the First World War and they include phosgene, tear gas and mustard gas. 
Um, it's incredibly deadly and one canister or container can kill many men. Death after exposure to gas is extremely slow, painful, and it can take weeks to kill you. Um, going in the right direction, it would carry the gas to your enemies. However, if the wind changed or was blowing in the wrong direction, it could blow the, back, uh, the gas back onto you, um, which means that obviously you would uh, kill or injure your own troops. Um, gas masks were developed in 1916 to help lessen the impact of gas attacks and fewer men died. So gas are, are very effective at the beginning. I think with gas as well, it was the terror of seeing this gas come across the trenches and knowing that you could do very little about it. But when the gas masks were, it would cause men to just completely panic and that they had or anything they were doing. Um, but when the gas masks were developed, obviously it lessened the impact. So rifles and field guns, uh, British soldiers during the First World War and the Second World War were issued with Lee Enfield rifles. They could fire around 10 bullets without needing to be reloaded, which was really good for the time. They're reliable, they're accurate. However, they had to be cleaned really regularly because they could clog up really easily with dirt and stop working, which obviously in the trenches, dirty, muddy conditions was more likely to happen. So they are quite good. Um, it's technology that has been used before, quite reliable technology. However, the dirt was a problem. Planes. So planes at the time that the First World War broke out had been in the air for about a decade and they were used uh, for reconnaissance. So reconnaissance were almost like spy planes. They could fly over the enemy trenches, gather information. It was good because generals and army leaders could use this information to plan their next move. They could, for example, spot weaknesses in the enemy trenches, places that weren't as well defended and maybe plan to attack at that point. They could spot gaps in the barbed wire. Um, however, planes are new, they're very unreliable, they're dangerous to fly, and it's interesting that the life expectancy of a pilot during the First World War was just 70 flying hours, because these planes uh, would break down, they'd run out of fuel, and artillery was developed that could literally shoot these planes out of the sky. Planes are another piece of technology that does develop quite a lot in the First World War, and when we do a revision uh, video on the end of the war, we will look at how technology develops. OK, so that is the end of this video. We've covered quite a lot there. Uh, my next video will be all about the four major battles of the First World War. Next time. Bye.